We'll be playing Gran Turismo Concept 2002 Tokyo Geneva, and I thought we'd start by looking at some of the mistakes that people make, usually when playing racing games. And that tends to be a lack of braking. Too many people think that uh, flat out is the only way to go around the circuit, and uh, when in fact braking is, is the key to a really good lap. Um, it allows you to take more speed in and out of the corner and therefore get around the lap quicker. That's some of the mistakes people make. Coming in too deep, braking too late, and then obviously getting out, running out of road, um, sometimes going off the track altogether. So that's how not to do it, and let's try and take a look at it now and how it should be done. Coming up to the first hairpin, and it's a fairly tight left-hander, using all of the track on the way out, trying to make each corner into as straight a line as possible. Um, down the start, straight finish, going over to the right to take as wide a line into this one. Easy on the brakes, just to set ourselves up for this corner. Down into third. A bit too much curb there, but it's okay. We've got the um, tyre wear switched off. Easy on the brakes. Missed the first corner because it allows a better line into the second set. So actually the second part of that chicane is a faster line. This is a tricky corner. Going into it fairly slow because it tightens up right at the end. So the apex is actually back there rather than where you'd expect it to be. You need as much traction and power as you can to get up this hill. Usually taking flat out in some of the lower cars, but we're in a fairly fast car here in 350 LM Nissan. So uh, we need to brake a little bit. Right across to the right-hand side now to go into this left hairpin again. A bit too wide, not too worried, but use all of the track, even that slip road on the way out. And then short straight, easy on the brake. Double apex here, so you want to treat that as one corner. Imagine the apex is a point somewhere between those two. Use all of the road on the way out. So the secret to a good lap is Reasonable braking. Reasonable braking will give you a reasonable lap time. I'm Violet Berlin and this is Gamepad. It absolutely will not stop. Equally unstoppable is Ikaruga. Although Ikaruga's got a retro vibe, it's a conversion of an arcade game from just last year and it bears the distinction of being the last major release on the Dreamcast in Japan. We're desperately glad we got hold of this one. First, it reminded us just how much we love 2D scrolling shooters. And secondly, it reminded us just how much we love the Dreamcast, a console which, from beyond the grave, brings us a shoot 'em up of such beauty. And then when we dabbed our misty eyes with a hanky and got our hands on the joypad, we forgot all about that because we were rocked on our heels at how different this game is from any other shoot 'em up we've played. Now, not only is it stupidly fast and stupidly frantic, but it's also cleverly different. You might already have noticed that it isn't just a question of shooting and avoiding. There's something else to the gameplay. But if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you yet. Try and work it out by watching. Look at the ship you control, surrounded by a shield. That's not just some temporary power-up we've collected. That's always there. But even though you've got a shield, you've still got to dodge bullets, but not all of them some bullets you want to hit you. Here's another clue. Look at how the bullets coming towards the ship are either black or white. And notice how you can change the shield to black or white too. And fire black or white as well. You can switch the colour of your own ship to absorb bullets of the same colour. When enough energy has been absorbed, you can fire it back. However, you do twice as much damage if you hit an enemy of the opposite colour to you. Confused yet? Now add to this something called chaining. You get a bonus for three enemies of the same colour that you destroy, which multiplies for every consecutive set of three. It's one intricate, original and hardcore game. Ikaruga was designed by Treasure, who created Radiant Silvergun, one of the most inspirational, expensive and rare games on Sega's last but one console, the Saturn. With 
Ikaruga, they're not just sticking to Sega formats, though. As well as the Dreamcast, a version is due on the GameCube anytime soon. But can you handle it? Next time on Gamepad, clunk click every trip. Burnout 2, the game that wants you to drive badly. Just as we thought that the keys to the Batmobile were about to drop into our laps, it was announced that the game's still not out of the production tunnel. So Batman Dark Tomorrow won't emerge for quite a while, but Bat fans take courage. Gamepad secured an audience with its Japanese designer to find out more details. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty is one of the biggest games ever. And Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance on the Xbox is going to be even bigger. Well, in the physical sense, anyway. It's got new characters, plots and game modes, and we get to grips with it. All that and more next time on Gamepad. I was Violet Berlin, and I'll leave you now with this thought. Mm hmm. And this eye candy. Not computer graphics for a change, it's live action video that sets the scene for the getaway. You're on the run. You killed your wife. You left the murder weapon behind at the scene. <laughs> You're a convicted bank robber! What do you think your chances are? I know where your kid is. I can even get to him. I know the layout and the security. All of it. Get up. You're still not paying attention. Do you think the filth are going to believe you? Driver and Dead Ezar in the brand new series of The Riches. Wednesday at 9, exclusive to Virgin One. Welcome to Spy School, the show that sheds new light on the dark world of espionage. In the next half hour, we'll be revealing the techniques used by agents in the field and trying out their methods for ourselves. And I'll be on standby to make sure they're up to the challenge. My name's David Shaler. I used to work for British Intelligence. Coming up, our two rookies experiment with disguise as they attempt to fool their friends into believing they're someone else. I'll be showing you how to change your fingerprints and we'll be hearing from Richard Tomlinson, the ex-MI6 spy, on the run from the British government in Europe. But first, the art of concealing messages. It's all very well collecting classified documents in the field, but how do you get that information to your handler? The best way to do this is to hide the information within other innocent-looking messages. The most famous way of concealing information is by microdot. This is a tiny piece of film about one millimetre across, which can easily, for example, be hidden under a stamp on an envelope. It has been used by intelligence agencies since the American Civil War in the 1860s. Sarah Lee Lewis is an expert on photography, so she'll be showing Lorna and Julian how they are manufactured. We've been told that we need to get photographic evidence of the Special Forces Club in Knightsbridge. Membership is restricted to people who've been in the Special Forces, so there may be some very useful contacts in there. Also, once we've got the photos, we're going to be taken off to a dark room in a secret location to be shown how to turn it into a micro dot. I'll sit this way a little. OK, I'm actually framing Lorna slightly out of the centre of the picture, using her as cover. One more, dear. 
in case that anyone should spot me. Right, now that we've got the photos, we need to see how to turn them into a microdot. Lorna and Julian are now off to meet Sarah Lee Lewis, an expert in photographic techniques and the manufacture of microdots. Hi there. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi. Julian? That's right. Nice uh, and uh, Lorna? Hi. I understand you've got some film containing information you'd like to turn into a microdot. Oh, indeed. Right, right there. Thank you. OK. So, first of all, we've got to process this film. Right. There are three elements you need to process film. You've got your developer, you've got your stop bath, and you've got your fixer. In a dark room, the film is loaded onto a spiral and placed in the developing tank. Would you like to pour that in for me, please? Then the developer is added to the tank. OK. Put that on top, and then agitate for the first 30 seconds, gentle inversions. After further agitation, the fixer is added, then the precious film is washed down with water. The processed film can now be removed from the tank, ready for the next stage. Here's your photograph of the building. So now I'm going to put my mask here, then place that underneath the mask. We are going to re-photograph that as a small proportion of your negative, so that when it's processed, it'll just be the tiniest little microdot. You could even make it smaller again by re-photographing that again, and then it would be undetectable. You could even use it as a full stop on a letter or something. Really? And no one would ever find it, yeah. The film is removed from the camera and processed in the same way as before. Yep, looking good. We've got something you can use there. So, I think this looks like about the best one. Yeah, it's the smallest, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Should we go for that one? This technique of manufacture is known as the British method. Agents could have microdot viewers so small they could be concealed inside a cigarette. Let's have a look through the microscope. Okay. What do you think? Wow. It's really sharp, isn't it? Mm. Microdots were then hidden in secret chambers of rings or coins or embedded under the stamp on a letter. Excellent. The stamp you use, try and make it common or garden as boring as possible because in other countries or other places, as in Egypt once, a spy used a very exotic stamp that was stolen by the post office worker and the microdot was revealed. Now on the show, Spy Hard, our crash course in martial arts. Here, Guyu Royu expert Gavin Mulholland tells us the best way to deal with a double crossing agent. My name is Gavin Mulholland. I've been involved in the martial arts for 34 years. I hold black belts in four different combat systems. OK, I know the agent I'm meeting has been turned. I need to neutralise him fast before he can blow my cover. Hey, okay. got a cigarette? <laughs> I need to initiate movement from him, using a cigarette packet. I need to take him out. We need to take him out fast. About the 60, several agents were found with crushed trachea. This is the sort of technique that might have been used to do it. Obviously, it takes a lot of training to get this right. This Under no circumstances should this be attempted. <laughs> Coming up later on Spy School, we investigate an assassination operation by Israel's Mossad, probably the most efficient secret service in the world, and we reveal the secrets of successful disguise. Now, an update from Spy School regular Richard Tomlinson, the rogue British agent wanted by the government in connection with the publication of MI6 officers' names on the net. Here, he discusses the personnel on a counter-narcotics operation. <laughs> He was working in the anti-drugs division, and he knew nothing about drugs. And he, he was sort of saying to me, well, he asked me, oh, can you, Richard, can you explain to me what the difference between all the drugs are? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I've heard of marijuana, and how, that's one, the one you smoke, isn't it? And he said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then and say, as he said, well, and uh, cocaine, what do you do with that? And I said, well, the cocaine's a sort of white powder, and you sniff that up your nose, or you, that's one of the ways you can take it. And he said, well, what happens when you take E then? And I said, well, 
you, you know, whenever you go, you, have you never been into a club? Whenever you go into a club and you see those those people with uh, the big, wide open eyes and sort of really happy people, that's because they're on E. And he sort of said, oh, are you a member of a club then? Which club are you a member of? <laughs> and I said, oh, sorry, what do you mean? And, I, and he said, oh, I'm a member of the Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> Which club are you talking about? And he said, oh, the nightclub. And he said, what, you go to nightclubs? And he was so impressed that I'd been to a nightclub. And it was, I just, I, we, I could hardly stop myself laughing. And he, he was working against the drugs, uh, penetrating a drug ring. I don't think he got very far. <laughs> cobbler. A cobbler is an espionage technician whose expertise is forging false documents, such as passports, visas, birth certificates, diplomas, government documents, and even currency. Now we're going to take a look at the most modern methods of concealing and encoding messages, computer encryption. Lorna and Julian have to work out which ex-British intelligence officer they're going to meet later in the show from information hidden in a photo file on a laptop. On this laptop, we have an image. In this image, there is information about a meeting. Have you any idea how you're going to find it? No, <laughs> to be honest with you. I'm going to leave you to it. So, I'll see you in a little while. Thanks. Do you know anything about that kind of stuff? Julian and Lorna are in the deep end here. They have to find a message hidden within a computer JPEG file. They have no knowledge of the computer software. Oh, hello. Oh. Who's that? What's that? There are, in fact, two images concealed within this file. They have to find both of them. Is it doing anything? Okay, so hit the other eye. No. Oh, it's Annie Mashin, David Shaler's girlfriend. The very same. <sighs> I don't even know what are we looking for. They've identified the target, but they still have to locate the hidden message. So is there a clue in this? Oh, <gasps> what was that? Well, you zoomed in on that, didn't you? Not on purpose, I didn't. Now they've worked out how to zoom in, oh, right. they must check every detail of the picture. Right, go through the whole thing, the whole, go around the whole picture. Sure. A, yeah, there must be a clue somewhere. What's that? Oh, it's What's just snow. What's that? What's that red thing? Oh. That is something. LW, LW 4pm. 4 4pm. Oh, LW and... Uh, Animation. This form of covert message exchange is used by terrorist groups throughout the world. How'd you get on? We got that. Eventually. Ah, oh, well done. That's very good. Which we take to mean that Lorna's supposed to meet Annie at 4 p.m. That's right. Very good. Very good. You'll find these days this is a very common way of passing information. Uh, the people who organised September the 11th used the internet, used JPEGs transferring information hidden in images. After the break, we investigate the assassination of Iyad al-Meshad, an Egyptian engineer who is working for the Iraqis, and we take a look at hiding messages during World War II. I took a good old fall, and I'm building myself back up again. I want someone to help me. Living with Jade Goody. Coming soon, exclusive to living. Plenty more still to come on this episode of Spy School. David Shaler will be showing you how to fake your own fingerprints, and I'll be interviewing ex-MI5 officer Annie Mashon. The Special Operations Executive was a group of British undercover agents who worked alongside the French resistance to counter the Nazi threat. Now on the SOE syllabus, we look at how to hide messages. The use of invisible inks by SOE agents was vital as the enemy often intercepted mail. Agents arranged to use common household substances such as milk, soap solution, lemon juice and egg whites that would not arouse suspicion if found during an enemy raid. Agents often experimented to find new suitable inks. Aside from the two obvious requirements of being invisible and capable of being developed, the substance must also be odourless, soluble and must leave no deposits or marks on the paper. Heat was the most common developer of secret inks. 
Urine was widely used as an invisible ink, and it's also suggested that male semen was also experimented with, but proved to be unsuitable. Whether you're an MI5 officer performing a covert search or a burglar stealing someone's stereo, the most obvious way to get caught is to leave your fingerprints at the scene. If you want to avoid doing that, you should obviously wear gloves, but where that's not appropriate, you should use other techniques which we're going to look at now. One of the things you can do is to sand down your fingerprints. This removes the distinctive ridges on the tips and makes your fingerprints unidentifiable. It's quite simple to do. You start with a coarse sandpaper and finish up using a fine emery board. That should last for about three weeks. You shouldn't uh, file them too far down though, or this will leave scar tissue, and that will be just as identifiable as your actual fingertips. A similar technique is using waterproof household cement. This fills in the ridges on the fingertips. In both cases though, you have to be quite careful because your finger's not as sensitive and it's much more difficult to grip things. The third technique is to use liquid latex like this. All you do is take a sizeable dollop and smear it on the ends of your fingers. Like that. You then wait for it to dry and again, you've disguised the ridges on your fingertips. When you've finished using it, you just peel it off. But get rid of the peelings, because they have a copy of your fingerprints on them, so your dabs could be left at the scene of a crime where you haven't been. Snow job. When a secret service produces vast amounts of confusing reports and offloads them onto the enemy through double agents, it is called a snow job. The aim is to get them to waste vast numbers of man hours by sifting through useless paperwork. Up next on Spy School, The Assassination Files. In this episode, we look at the case of Iha al-Mashad, an Egyptian engineer who worked for the Iraqis. Having decided that Mossad either needed to turn him or kill him, the Israeli Secret Service, as ruthless as ever, took the second option. Nineteen seventy seven, Paris. Mossad suspected that the French government was providing Iraq with a nuclear capability. This was a grave threat to the Israeli state, so the Secret Service sent a team of officers to raid the plant in France, masquerading as an organization called the French Ecological Group. But the French responded by building a new plant, aided by Iyad al Mashad, an Egyptian engineer who was sent over by the Iraqis. Mossad decided that because of his expertise in nuclear power engineering, al Mashad must either be recruited or killed. In 1980, al Mashad went to Paris to arrange for a shipment of nuclear fuel to go to Baghdad. He was in his hotel room when a team from Mossad arrived to assassinate him. Three Mossad agents patrolled the garden of his hotel, while two others, dressed in room service uniform, used the hotel's master key to get into al Mashad's room. While he was sleeping, the agents cut his throat and stabbed him in the heart. The wound was fatal. When the assassination was complete, the men ransacked his room to make it look like a burglary, hung a do not disturb sign on his door and left in silence. A prostitute later confirmed to French police that she had serviced al Mashad shortly before his death and later heard unusual movement coming from his room. Just hours after she'd made her statement, the prostitute was mysteriously killed in a hit and run incident. To this day, the Iraqis still do not have a nuclear capability. Annie Mashon is an ex-intelligence officer. She worked with David Shaler at MI5, and they're now partners. After David alleged that British intelligence had funded a plot to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi, they fled to France together. I met up with her to discuss what life was like on the run with David. Annie, thanks for coming on Spy School. Um, your decision to flee the country and also kind of turn your back or turn against the institution that you'd both been working for must have been a very difficult one to make. What clinched it for you? What made you decide to go? I don't think there was any one sort of dramatic moment when we decided we were going to do it. I mean, it was more an accumulation of, of disillusionment with the service when we were there. So the best thing was to get Dave out of the country where he could try and then give his most serious allegations directly to government so that they would listen to him. So you started off in Holland? Well, we were travelling around for a, quite a long time, about a month, of just travelling around without destination, just changing hotel after, you know, going from hotel to hotel. Um, getting pretty paranoid as well about the fact we knew they'd be after us, trying to stay one step ahead. What was the stickiest situation you found yourselves in? A journalist approached us via our lawyer, John Modham. He 
sort of introduced himself and then immediately said, I'm not going to beat about the bush. I'm here as a representative of the Libyan intelligence services. Oh, and by the way, I'm armed. And he patted under his, oh, great. his um, arm, yeah. <laughs> and Dave and I sort of froze at that point, thinking, oh my God, what, that? what, what have we got ourselves into here? And he basically said that he was there to make an offer. He was prepared to offer David millions of pounds in return for information about the Lockerbie suspects who were still wanted by right. the UK at that point and also details about the Gaddafi plot and agents in, the, in Libya. So of course, you know, you give that sort of information, people are going to die. That is betraying your country. Um, so of course, Dave said no, and it was really a case of how quickly could we get out of that meeting. So at this point, we were on the phones to our lawyers, and they rang up MI5, they rang up the French equivalent, which is the DST, and they, both organisations both organization said it was the problem for the other one, and they weren't going to do anything about it. So what exactly happened when David got arrested? They arrested him in the hotel foyer and were going to cart him off without telling anyone about it. Um, but luckily Dave's actually quite quick thinking, he's very quick on his feed. So when they said, do you have any ID, Mr Shaler, and all that sort of thing, he said, well, I've got the passport out of my hotel room, knowing that I was there, but also knowing the passport wasn't there. So at least I knew that something had happened to him, otherwise he would have just vanished. So what time did you decide to go back to Britain? We really felt we had taken it as far as we could with Dave abroad, yeah. and it was time to come back. And I suppose there's a sense of... Um, coming back and facing the music. It used to be yeah. one of the charges that was levelled against yeah. him by the right-wing press. You know, if he believes this so much, he should do this. Um, so he has. And he thinks it's important enough to risk going to prison for. Now, when out in the field, an agent on surveillance may need to change their appearance. It may be as simple as a change of clothes, but on an extended operation, it may need to be more dramatic. Disguise is an essential skill for every agent and is taken very seriously by the Secret Services. The CIA have a department exclusively devoted to it, headed by one of their top-ranking officers, Antonio Mendez. The expert I'm putting them in touch with is Catherine Scobie, a professional makeup artist. She should be able to teach them the tricks of the trade. After all, when the CIA were looking into disguise, they turned to Max Factor for help. I've decided to go as um, a tourist, um, preferably French because I know I can do the accent, so... Right, good. Kind of, and I thought quite chic. Well, I see you as uh, having dark hair. So if you have dark hair, then your skin's going to be pale. Right. Your eyebrows are going to be darker. I'm going to put some uh, dark colour through your eyebrows and brush your eyebrows the wrong way to change the shape. It really makes a difference. Right, so now we can put the wig on you. I'm going to change the colour of your lips now because to me they're very red and throw somebody off the scent as it were. What on earth is this? This is yellow stuff. Nicotine colour. It's going right. to just bring the gleaming whiteness down a bit. Vanity's out the window, I'm afraid. I've got some glasses for you to try. So, Lorna, what do you think? Yeah, it feels really comfortable and it does feel really, really different. So, Julian, do you want to tell me about your mission? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be a flower deliverer. Um, probably caught me a bit of a geezer, uh, but I haven't worked out much more than that. A freshly groomed goatee. You have a very nice suntan, so I think we should get rid of that. Now, how to make yourself look older. If you just brush your dark colour into those creases, then blend them away again with your finger. I'm going to attempt to change the shape of your nose. Take some tiny bits of cotton wool and pack into your nose. Ah. Oh. Shouldn't actually be too painful. That's quite good. We should now talk about what else you can do with cotton wool if you want to pack out your top lip. It's not a good look, is it? Try that one on the sides. The other thing you can do, being male, is play around with facial hair, like moustaches. It's just left for Julian and Lorna to get changed before preparing their cover stories in more detail. They have to meet up with someone they know well without being recognised. I've got my disguise on. Uh, I'm going to now go around to my flatmates and uh, try and convince her that I'm a flower seller without her recognising me. I'm in my disguise. I'm a French moody person who needs directions to Leicester Square and uh, I'm going to try and not get rumbled by one of my old school friends who's here to meet a mutual mate of ours. Um, I just hope that she doesn't work out it's me.
Good afternoon, madam. Uh, Lorna is still waiting for her friend. Afternoon, madam. Uh, flowers for a uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Rolf. Okay, lovely. W would you mind? Uh, yeah. Put on your... Can I can sign that. Sure. Um, what's the time? It's about four o'clock, isn't it? Four o'clock. Yeah, you're a very lucky man. Flowers like that. They're beautiful, aren't they? Uh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you, madam. Lorna spots her friend and runs to catch up with her. Excuse me. Excuse me. Do you know Le Leicester Square? Leicester Square? I thought it was you. Oh, I don't <laughs> believe it. I've been rumbled. <laughs> don't I look French? Yes! <laughs> uh, sorry, madam. Uh, there seems to be some kind of mistake here, actually. Oh, uh, what I think you've done is you've got a bit of a case of uh, mistaken identity. <laughs> 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 Mission completed. Join Kelly Brook and relive the dream. <laughs> Love that one! Dirty Dancing, the time of your life. Wednesday at 9, exclusive to living. Welcome to Spy School, the show that unlocks the best kept secrets in espionage. From surveillance to seduction, this is all you need to know. How to survive in the clandestine world inhabited by the best spies and how to use their techniques to get on in your career and even your love life. And I'm here to see that everything's done by the book. My name's David Shaler. I used to work for British Intelligence. Coming up, our two rookies will be following in the footsteps of some of the world's most legendary lovers to see whether they can cut it as sexpionage agents. We go back to World War II to see how the special operations executive were taught to evade searches, and renegade MI6 officer Richard Tomlinson will be here with his exclusive take on espionage in the Tomlinson tapes. Everyone knows that seduction is one of the most useful methods of obtaining information from people. Karl Helfman, who worked for the East German Stasi, had so many frustrated secretaries to satisfy that when he was finally captured by West German counterintelligence, the spy only muttered, thank God, now I am safe from 